Yeah, you saw the title. Hello everybody, I'm Maris of the Art Sheep. Let's not waste time on this one, because this is the longest video script I have ever made outside of maybe my 200th video, and that was a couple of years ago. And oh boy, is this video long. I knew going into this whole project that this video would be my longest one, but I had no idea this review would be this long. So if YouTube did cooperate with me, I put lots of bookmarks in this video so that way you can hop to a particular portion that you would like to listen to if you want to hear my thoughts on that particular segment or feel free to watch it on double speed, which is probably what my brother will do if he actually bothers to watch this thing. Also, I will be posting the speed paint of this drawing separately, independent of the review, so that way you can see it without the interruptions of the editing that I attempted to do for this video. Until then, enjoy my wish review and dissection of modern Disney. But first, a little bit of concept of the drawing I think should be talked about and then I will talk about this disaster of a chat GPT film. Oh yeah, and spoilers. All the spoilers. Okay, let me be straight. I don't mind Ash's design. Well, if you ignore the fact that it's the same Disney style that's been used since Tangled. However, it does have a few flaws. First off being the color of her dress blends too much with the background. One other person who reviewed this film, I'm gonna link down to it down below, said the same thing, so I know it was not just me. They suggested orange for an alternative color since uh, Disney Princess or Heron, whatever you want to call these ladies, uh, hasn't been used. I always thought orange was Moana's color. I don't know, maybe it's Coral or Turquoise, I haven't watched Moana yet. I am going to watch Moana though. However, I do know I hate orange, it's not my favorite color, and is that reason for me not to pick it? Uh, yes, but um, probably not for this video if I'm doing a proper redesign. However, it's just not what I think of when I hear Disney's 100th anniversary. Blue is probably more of the color that I do think of, and no, I'm not just saying that because blue is my favorite color. Look at the castle, look at the ads, the blue fairy, the fact that almost every Disney princess up to Rapunzel has at least worn blue once or has some blue in her outfit. Snow White sleeves are blue. Cinderella's maid outfit is blue. One of Aurora's dresses is blue. Ariel wears blue. Belle wears blue. Jasmine wears blue. Nella, if you want to count her, who is a lion, has blue eyes. And Pocahontas has blue via her necklace. And Mulan wears blue. Tiana wears blue. And outside of Rapunzel, it goes on even past her. Elsa wears blue. Anna and Moana's outfits have blue in them. And Mirabelle's skirt is a variant shade of bluish green. And Raya has a little bit of blue in the trim of her collar. I checked. However, I can't see where people would say that blue is overdone. I then thought maybe something of a little bit better would be more appropriate, and that is a silver dress with a slight rainbow iridescent tint to it. And I think that fits. This is literally the color that Disney has been doing for their 100th anniversary merchandise. So yeah, you can make her dress she's first seen in be a little bit more bland and simple and make it even a callback to Aurora's, who I might add is the only Disney princess maiden, whatever everyone call them, who I've ever seen wear black and gray. And uh, yeah, give her something maybe like that and then towards the end give her like a magical dress and have it be um, reminiscent of the blue fairy or fairy godmother since that's kind of what she's supposed to be. You could say that Disney wouldn't make their iconic dress that the girl is supposed to be wearing only seen once in the movie, but I mean, Ariel's only worn her dress like for one brief dinner scene. Belle wears her iconic dress for two short scenes, and Mulan wears her dress only once. You can make it work. So, yeah. Well, outside of the art style, uh, being bland and boring. I didn't really have any problems with Asha's design. I liked her hair a lot. It was really pretty. 
too. My brother pointed out that her hair is parted to one side and it's a way for them doing the half shade look. You know, the one that all strong, independent women are supposed to have without actually shaving a Disney princess's head. I'm not sure if that was their intent, but I know that now that I've seen it, I can unsee it. Cause that's, uh, that one shaved side haircut has to die. So unless the person's a villain or supposed to be annoying, I never want to see it again. So I just made her box braids be even on both sides. Rather than that, I pretty much kept the original intent. I'm fine with her design. Okay, so that's what I thought of Asha's design. What did I think of her character? Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves, my precious. We're first going to talk about the plot, and then we will talk about everything else in this film. So buckle up, my sheep, and let's not waste any more time on this one. It will be a long one. Anywho, the story starts off with a picture book similar to the one in Snow White, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, and it tells of the story of the Kingdom of Rosas, which is ruled by the good King Magnifico, which I'm going to say straight out the gate is a dumb name. If this film was good, I could have accepted it, but it's not, so into the plot of flaws it goes. I've lost all patience for this, so yeah. The king lets everyone and anyone, no matter their backgrounds, come into his kingdom of Rosas. And since this is Disney World, I guess that's not a bad idea. So they, they just do it. One comment I did have upon my first interaction to Wish and also my first video that I made on this subject was I wasn't sure how a kingdom set in like the 1300s Europe was so ethnically diverse since the world during this time was pretty ethnically segregated. However, they do give a reason for it, and I think it's a perfectly fine reason. So, out of preconceived judgments that I had of this film, I will recant that one and admit that I was wrong. I'm totally satisfied for the reason that they gave. Although that's the only preconceived judgment that I'm going to be taking back. I was right about all the rest of them. Anyway, after the storybook moment ends, it then shows Asha and her baby goat, Valentino, getting her grandfather, Sabino, ready for his 100th birthday. A nice simple nod to Disney's 100th anniversary. And to be honest, it's the only nicer one in this film, at least to me, because the rest kind of come off a little bit more forced and honestly make me want to hit myself over the head in frustration. And also, the scene is nice, but I'm gonna be honest, the dialogue seems a little clunky. Uh, tells you that it's his birthday and how the wish granting ceremony is today and how it's his time to get his wish granted because no one is more deserving of it. And with all honesty, that's really nice. One aspect I do like about Asha is that she genuinely seems to care about her family. And I like that. That's a very admirable thing to do, to take care and love your family. Should be the base interaction that all humans should be said to, but that isn't always the case. So I like the fact that they show that. However, the dialogue between her grandfather just kind of comes off as more of clunky exposition. I get that you need to tell these things, but it doesn't seem like a natural conversation. It just more seems like it's... Okay, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen later on down the road because we want the demon goat to speak later on. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> anyway, the scene right after that is her blowing off her mom and her grandfather in helping her mom bake her grandfather's cake to go to her job, which is a tour guide thing, and then she has to also help her friend which is nice, but you just blew off your family. And yet, you see what I mean? It's kind of a little bit of an issue for me. She then goes, gives her tour via song. I'll talk more about the music later. And um, it pretty much just explains how the kingdom works in more depth than what the book just did. And that's pretty much all. It doesn't really tell us anything about Asha and just pretty much tells us the stuff that the book didn't tell us. And because we did just get the book, this just kind of seems like the leftovers from the book. And this whole entire scene is just not giving the right impression. And first impressions are important. It is revealed later that she is actually going to 
an interview to be Magnifico's apprentice. And the reason why she wants to be his apprentice is because she is hoping to get her grandfather's wish granted. And that's nice, but I feel like things are a little bit out of order. And I just feel like you could have done something else to make it a little bit more smoother in its um, presentation. To me, this is how you would fix all of this. Remove the idea about her already being a tour guide. I get why that is there. It is so she can sing about the Kingdom of Rosas and explain the lore to the audience and have it be more natural because she's explaining it to new people that she is giving a tour to. It makes sense, I understand it, it still doesn't work in my opinion. Just because something makes sense doesn't mean it's always the best idea. Here's what I think should have happened. Instead, have the first scene of Asha be seen planning her grandfather's birthday idea. That idea of being getting his wish granted. She then realizes that she is running late because she got caught up in her planning. And then have her hurry downstairs and then have her get distracted, have a nice moment with her um, mother and her grandfather. It would be a little bit rushed, but you can do this if you are skilled at your writing, which at one time Disney used to be. And then have her realize once again that she is running late, so she then has to hurry out the door. And then have the song be focused on telling you about Asha while Asha tells her view on the kingdom. Kind of like how the song Belle did, with it focusing on what Belle thought of the town and the town's people, and the town's people were singing what they thought about Belle. And it's really not that hard, and if you want to change things up a little bit from the Beauty and the Beast Belle song format, you can show Asha easily getting distracted, but not on stupid things, but on her being a genuinely kind and caring person. Show her helping people, like helping a kid get a kite out of a tree or saving a cat from a runaway cart. It does show her being nice somewhat in the song, but she's a tour guide, that's kind of her job. If you're not doing that, then are you even doing your job, <laughs> in my opinion? Mulan is a never movie that did what I am referring to here great. She is late because she is writing cheat sheets because she does not have the confidence in herself and it shows that she needs to be reminded of the basics, showing her that this is not her specialty. She is then, however, shown to be uh, great at ingenuity because she still does her obligated chores, but she uses her dog in a smart way to get him done. She then has a quick, nice moment with her father and she then leaves. It is then the song, Honor to Us All, um, starts and while the song plays, Mulan is shown on her way to be smart, caring, and still has her own taste which is kind of untraditional for her setting. And the song informs us also of the type of burden that a woman has in China. It shows us how very important this session with the matchmaker is. And it also tells us how Mulan is not a traditional Chinese woman. And the reason she wants to succeed at this so badly is because to fail is to bring dishonor to her family. So both Belle and Mulan's films achieve what I am talking about and what I would want in this movie perfectly. And those films were both shorter than this film. This isn't that hard, Disney. You've done it before. Oh wait, no you haven't because the people who worked on those films are not the people who worked on this film. Going back to what actually happens in the film and not what I want to happen in the film, the song then states that in return for letting the people stay in Rosas, they are encouraged to give up their wish at the age of 18 to King Magnstupido, and then he grants them every month. Which, for the record, if Magnstupido was going to grant every wish, it would take forever. If there was 5,000 people that were over 18 in this kingdom, according to my brother, who's way better at math than I am, especially in the morning, if he was to grant one every month, then it would take 416 years to get to them all. 
So it doesn't matter if you live a long time, if he did him randomly, there would be still no guarantee that he would ever get to you. So, yeah. After the song, Asha then arrives and talks with her seven stupid friends, and they have a bit of banter. We find out that each of them is loosely based off of the dwarves from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and that one of them, the one based off of Sleepy, hasn't quite been the same since his wish is granted. They say he's boring now, but we don't know him, so it doesn't really come off that way i mean how are we supposed to know he's different you, you oh you're telling us th th that's great anyway asha asks for ideas of what her flaws are her friend tells her no no you care too much i do <laughs> <laughs> are you serious that would have really helped if we saw in the previous song of her caring we don't. At least not enough, in my opinion. Asha then heads up to her interview after the queen tells her that he is ready for her. I first thought that she was actually late, and that's kind of why I wrote my rewrite the way I did with her being late, and then I kind of liked that idea, so I just kind of kept it in. But upon second check of this scene, I realized that she wasn't late. The first um, interview just ended early, and apparently ended horribly, which honestly, I kind of want to know how that happened, because how worse could it be? Because the first thing Asha does when she gets up there is touch his stuff, and by his stuff, I mean his special book that has forbidden magic in it. So because of that, he's got, like, magic on the glass protecting it, and Asha sets it off, and then it kind of attacks her. Uh, uh, is this a nitpick of me complaining that she's touching his book? Probably yes. Do I care? No. Because this scene is only existing to set up the book and maybe it's good that they do it. I mean, obviously it is good and you need to set it up, but I don't know. It just kind of feels like bleh. I guess I would say one positive is, is that the interaction between her and the king is kind of nice here but that's all I got really to say about that, especially considering what Mag Stupido turns into later on. Despite the whole book-touching debacle, Mag Stupido is still interested in hearing what Asha has to say and what her reasoning for her being his apprentice would be. And the first thing she tells him is that she cares too much, and it's her weakness. And she wanted to start with the negatives before she moves on to the positives, which... Yeah, this fails on two different reasons. One being Mag Stupido has never heard the friend say this. So to him, it is just her saying it about herself. And people who care don't need to tell ever people they care. Kind people don't tell ever people how kind they are. If they do, then they're probably not, you know, kind people, at least in my opinion. And yes, she only said this because the friend told her this. But again, Mag Stupido never heard that. So it's just gonna make her seem kind of self-centered and arrogant. And yes, that's kind of like calling pot meets kettle when you realize who Mag Stupido is. I mean, obviously he's very arrogant and very self-centered, but Asha doesn't know that. And Technically, if you ignored the commercials, the audience shouldn't know that by now. Yes, there's a whole bunch of murals and paintings and stuff like that, but it seems more like people make that because they love Magnifico, not because Magnifico is requesting them doing it. So, it's just kind of falls flat. And the second reason why this doesn't work is, like I said, the one who tells her this is her friend, which... Good on you for actually making it the friends say this and not Asha herself. Because like I said, kind people don't need to say how kind they are or how much they care. But, um, we just met the friend. We don't even know who she is. And we're having an aspect of Asha literally be told to us 
by a friend we just now met. This would have worked better if the friend said this fact about Asha later on. Maybe, like, the friend's second scene. But no, it's the first scene we see the friend in. And not also that, I guess this could be a third reason of why this doesn't work. Her flaw is that she cares too much, which yes, that can be a genuine flaw to a person. I mean, Tora Honda would be an example of this, Tora Honda from Fruits Basket. But that shouldn't be the only flaw. And if it's your only flaw, then that really just kind of makes them like a Mary Sue, if you ask me. So, yeah, it's just not the best all around. Weakness? Um, I get irrational when I'm nervous. Anyway. After she is done telling him her one flaw is she cares too much, she then shows the rest of her Glassdoor profile page off to him and lists her positives. Because remember, that was her flaw. This is her positives. She's, um, she's, um, one second. <laughs> hard, quick learner, she's helpful, she's young so she's malleable, but she's not too young so she can be brainwashed. Which yeah, those do seem like things you would want to say to someone you are giving, you know, an interview to. That does seem appropriate, but story-wise telling, because we haven't really seen these aspects in Asha, that much it just really oh like i said this whole thing just comes off as being guilty of showing not telling strike that reverse it uh telling not showing so yeah and if anybody knows anything about storytelling you want to show not tell so yep not good all around when listing off her talent, she says that she loves to draw, and so she shows him a flipbook animation that she made of a goat hopping. I guess it's a nice never little nod to Disney's 2D animation, or at least it would be if Disney actually, you know, did that and didn't disrespect it by calling it limited. But whatever, moving on. He doesn't quite get it. He doesn't really see it being a talent he kind of asks hey is that a talent and she's like it could be I learned from my dad and you could use this as an example to show how she sees the bigger picture and he just doesn't get it because he's not used to looking at things that way but she's never seen really drawing again and uh the flip book pencil thing doesn't really come back either so it's just a little reference to remind you that disney once did 2d animation that's really all it is at least to me and like i said he's not even really that impressed with her skill set which how does a flip book animation make you qualify to be a magical king's apprentice i mean just being a normal king's apprentice let alone a magical king i mean Yes, Magnifico is high on his own supply, and he definitely is very much of a narcissist, so he's not interested, and even if she was qualified, he might have not even been interested, but I don't see how being an artist quite makes you qualified to be a magician's apprentice. I'm gonna have to think about that one some more. Which, side note, that I just realized as I was writing the script for this review, why does King Max Stupido even need an apprentice? It's never explained. I mean, the king is obviously quite old in reality if he took the grandfather's wish 82 years ago, so there must be some kind of immortality to his magic. So is his magic running out now? Is he dying? Does he want some more free time? Does he just want an extra hand in the pot? Did he have an apprentice before and did they die? Or was the apprentice the queen and now that she's married and the queen, she can't be the apprentice anymore? I don't know. It's never said. I mean, King Magnifico doesn't even seem like he wants an apprentice. He seems like he just wants to be the only person who knows how to do magic. So why does he want an apprentice? Someone explain it to me if I got it wrong because this isn't making sense to me. Anyway, 
King Magstubero isn't really showing any interest in her talent, and she is not really showing any qualifications for this job, but yet for some reason, this interview continues. And she then says that she learned the flipbook art animation stuff from her father, who sadly passed away. He then mentions that he remembered him and how he was a philosopher who always talked about the stars, and Asha then tells how her father would take her up to look at the stars. Even when he was sick, he continued to do that, and that's honestly nice. I like that. Max Stupido then talks about his own tragic past, more about that in the individual character dissection. I will say, as of right now though, this seems pretty quick. Why is he opening up like this? I mean, Asha, I could make, that makes sense to me. She seems like someone who would, but he seems like someone a little too prideful to open up to someone this quickly. Has he never met anyone else in this kingdom who's had loss? Does he open up like this with everybody? I don't get it. And also, I still don't understand how that ever interview went so bad for the ever person to not even be considered by Magnifico. Whatever, moving on. Despite Asha not getting the job yet, he then shows her his secret wish room and how the system works. Why? Why would you tell her this? She doesn't have the job yet. Why wouldn't you as a writer just make it so she already has the job and she's starting her first day? Is it because the idea of it being a job interview is hashtag relatable? I don't know. Please, someone, tell me. Was this the first draft? A big movie made by Disney should not have a plot that I can fix off the top of my head. This isn't that hard. And I'm not patting myself on the back as a writer. I'm suck. This is on Disney for sucking worse. But hey, what can I say? AI has never been a suitable replacement for humans. So, despite Mag Stupido having no reason to tell her how the system works, he tells her how the system works. They say it's because he wants to see if he can trust her, but I don't know. It seems like he should kind of take some more slower baby steps first. Like, see if she's even worthy enough to hire before showing that she needs to prove herself. Then you tell her her big secret. He even says she's one of the few people he's shown this room. Was that basic, bland, generic interaction enough to bond over that you show her this room? Anyway, they sing a weird song about wishes. It's not great. It's not the worst. It sounds more like a romantic song. But then he explains to her how most of these wishes will never be granted, <clears throat> which we've already discussed, even if he was going to grant everyone at the rate he's doing now, they would never all be granted. And he won't give the wishes back because he fears some of them might be harmful, and he alone should decide what wishes will be granted. And he won't grant the grandfather's wish because the wish is to inspire people with music and he doesn't know what that could mean. And I guess since he has that big tragic backstory or whatever, they didn't really explain it that much, didn't go that in depth with it, but they did mention it. So I'm guessing you could assume that his reasoning is that these wishes could lead to dangerous things and since he's seen dangerous stuff happen and he didn't have magic then to stop it, he will now, you know, use magic to stop it from ever happening again, something like that. He then blows up at Asha, and then he takes her with him, and he sits her beside him and the queen to the wish-granting ceremony, and then he tells her she doesn't get the job, and the grandpa ain't getting his wish. Why would you even sit her up there anyway? If she doesn't have the job, why are you sitting here next to the king and queen? That definitely does make her look important, like she got the job, but I guess he just did it to show that her grandpa isn't getting the wish to stick it to her? I don't know. The earlier ads for this product, that's what I'm calling it, it was an ad for a product, not a trailer for a movie, gave off the impression that the issue that Asha would have with King Mag Stupido was the fact that he wasn't going to grant every single wish, to which the internet all said in unison, that's horrible, as people would make stupid wishes that they aren't certain of, or even worse, sometimes really, really dark things that should never 
be granted and you just shouldn't be teaching kids that it's wrong for the king to not give you whatever you want. But, um, I mean, that isn't the plot of the movie in the end. Kind of, more on that later. Although, I will say that I think Disney marketed the movie that way on purpose. I think they made people deliberately believe that Asha was just being a brat who was complaining that the king wasn't granting every single wish. So that way people would get the criticism of the film wrong. So that way when it was revealed what actually happens in the film, the people who watch the film would white knight for it and all future criticism would then be put into the same category of the criticism made by the people who haven't seen the whole movie and only saw that first intentional ad that misled people. I don't have proof that Disney did this on purpose, just that Disney would do it because they do it all the time. Asha then ends up going home and tells her grandfather and mother the truth. The grandfather, however, doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want to know that he has a wish that will never be granted because King Mag Stupido does not approve of it. The two then get into a sort of fight and she then leaves and then she ends up singing a vague song with vague lyrics. It is kind of catchy to be honest, but hey, so is the flu. And then it actively ends with her wishing upon a star. The star then comes down and kind of befriends her and despite the star not being able to grant the grandfather's wish for some reason, it will grant the animal's wishes when the animal's asks. And so the star commits a war crime by bringing this abomination of a sidekick to life by giving it a voice. I hate this goat. The only satisfying ending to this beast would be me eating it. I've always had an issue with sidekicks in movies, not side characters, sidekicks, there's a difference. Not so much with the older Disney films. I've never had an issue with any of them, really. I'm more referring to, like, the type of sidekicks you would see in Barbie films, as most of those were more juvenile and annoying. And this is a problem that Disney didn't have for a long time. I mean, Mushu did kind of fall under that at some times, but for the most time, he was very pleasant, and I actually did like him. But I definitely am starting to notice these problems with the newer sidekicks. Uh, one of the ones that is newer that I did not have this problem was at all was Pascal. Probably because he's one of the best, mainly because he doesn't talk. If him and Max from Tangled spoke, my love for that film would plummet. Olaf from Frozen 1 was actually fine because he was more calm and quiet. Well, I did have issues with him, but for the most part, I did enjoy him and I did actually laugh to his existence in the theater. Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. <laughs> it wasn't the same in Frozen 2. I hate him. He never shuts up. And Sisu the dragon. I'm not sure if that would count as a side character or a sidekick. But either way, it's cancer. Stop giving Aquafina a job, Disney. Remember the swamp? Remember my song in the swamp? And I was like, wah, chicka, wah, wah, chicka, wah, wah. I remember. <sighs> Make it stop, make it stop between her and Olaf too. I don't know which is worse. If I probably had to pick one, it'd probably be Sisu. Just kill them both though. And this goat. Moving on, the animals sing a stupid song about how we are all stars. And honestly, it sounds like a song from Disney's Junior. Oh wait, I actually take that back. I think Sophia the First. I definitely know the Tangled series. And am I getting this name right? I've only heard it once. Eleanor of Avalon? Uh, I know those have better music, so calling the music in this film even on that level is a crime. Again, more on the music later. After that, Asha then finds out that King Max Stupido wants to absorb the star's power. And I don't know, maybe this is me projecting my own ideas onto the OG Disney, but I kind of feel like the OG Disney would have said that the king wanted to eat the star. Since, to me at least, I don't know why, the idea of eating stars seems like a common enough practice. But now they don't because that idea is just too dark and scary. And even if I am wrong about this and you don't want the star to be eaten, you could still have done some other things because let's face it, this film has no edge. I've had sweaters that are sharper than this film. 
we are at the stage where Barbie films from the old era are darker than current Disney films. Once they tie the knot, I'll implement my plot. Then I'll use the king's head for croquet. I do not need blood, violence, or things that are not suitable for children, but there is a difference between putting things that are inappropriate for children inside a kid's movie and giving children a respectful and challenging theme. OG Disney did this, Don Bluth understood this, OG and even somewhat newer DreamWorks understands this, and even old Barbie movies understood this. Why don't you? Is it that hard? Anyway, despite the star not granting wishes, Asha decides to ask the star's help in getting her grandfather's wish from King Magstupido's wish vault, which... Okay, two side notes. First being, I understand that using magical powers to make a wish happen is different from asking the star to physically use its body to help, but I still don't understand why the star isn't just granting the wish. I mean, it did the unthinkable and granted that demon goat's wish so what's so hard about granting asha's grandfather's wish if you if the star did this film would be done and i would be saved but disney is not that kind anymore so here we go secondary side note asha is doing this all for the sake of getting her grandfather's wish granted which again is nice Again, I can't stress that enough, I do applaud them for making a character put a family member's wish in her top priority, especially an elder family member. I like that. However, they never really seem to do anything to show the relationship between her and her grandfather, and why he's so important to her outside of grandfather. And yes, you could say that's the base for all human interaction with one's grandfather, but hey, that really isn't the case in these days. And I think you could do something to show something between them. You don't even have to do a lot. Movies can make you feel for someone and make you convinced that they feel forever people in just one scene if they are done well. Disney has done this a lot of times before in the past. Just one scene and boom, you are in love. But this time, it's kind of absent, to be all honest. And so, the care that we are shown that Asha has for her grandfather just seems more like, this is what nice humans do, so I'm doing it. And getting his wish just seems more like a random MacGuffin to move the plot around so that way she has motivation for doing it. But I don't know, it just doesn't seem like the emotions are there. Another problem is, is that we don't even know what Asha's wish is, or even if she has one. You could say that her wish is just making other people's wishes come true, but that really does seem to have a little bit of an issue in itself, and the fact that she doesn't seem very enthusiastic about making other people's wishes come true. Well, let me explain it. She doesn't seem any more enthusiastic in doing that than doing anything else that she's seen doing, which you could say that she's just always an enthusiastic person and her base mode is helping people, but the problem is is that when you pretty much have the same reaction of enthusiasm to pretty much everything and it always ends up sparking you the same way, it's not really going to come across to your audience. It just seems like a very static and stale character setting. You get what I'm talking about? Moving on. And so Asha's on her way to go retrieve her grandfather's wish from King Mag Stupido's wish vault. However, on her way, the seven idiot friends find out about the existence of the star, and also this demon goat, and a whole bunch of dancing chickens. And for some reason, none of the friends suggest that it might be a good idea to kill that goat with fire. So sad. Moving on. One of them even says that Asha's like a fairy godmother. You get it? She's like a fairy godmother. We made a reference. Which, why a fairy godmother? Why not a, like, you know, just a fairy. Like, the blue fairy. You know, who was before the fairy godmother. Who also has more of a tie to Disney because... The whole theme of Disney is when you wish upon us. And no, maybe it's a nitpick. We'll just call it a nitpick because I've lost all patience with this film and we will move on to the next scene. 
One of the seven idiot friends, the one who's based off of Doc, who's also had the most screen time, helps Asha get into the king's chamber via dumbwaiter. Dumbwaiter for a dumb character. <laughs> Once up there, she then gets to work and starts looking for her grandfather's wish. Meanwhile, the same time that this all goes down, Max Stupido gets upset that the star has come down and he wants to be the only one who uses magic. He needs people to trust in him alone. And so he informs this to his kingdom to keep the king from finding out that Asha's like in the room above him, right behind him. The seven idiot friends start asking the king questions to hold Max Stupido up. He then starts to get mad at this, and he gets even more upset as more people start asking questions. And then he leaves. And then, cue the worst Disney villain song ever. And probably the worst in general, and in my opinion, definitely the worst in this film. My brother says that the star song before this was worser, and I do see his point. But I think this one fails more, so that makes it worse to me. Anyway, once again, more on the music later. In the song, Max Stupido uses the forbidden book, the one that Asha touched earlier. See, it didn't come out of nowhere. We brought it up twice. That makes it nice and smooth. Mm, it can, and obviously you need to bring it up to, you know, show it that exists before he uses it, but... And I am glad that they did that, but it just doesn't seem like you did it the smoothest maybe maybe like i said i've lost all patience so we'll just move on and say that this is a very minor practically non-existent flaw and honestly if the film was better i could probably i wouldn't even probably bring it up so yeah we'll just move on from that one more point that I will say about the song for now is that the visuals combined with the change of color scheme to uh, green and the fact that the tone of the song has also shifted to be more bombastic, the whole thing just kind of reminds me of In the Dark of the Night from Anastasia. In my brother's video review that we did for his channel, which probably won't come out for a while, so uh, it's not gonna be out so i can't link to it i said that no ever disney songs quite ended on the color green and i say friends on the ever side did not end on the color green and this was a mistake i haven't watched the princess and the frog in a long time so i did get that wrong there is green present in the princess and the frog song friends on the ever side which yeah frogs i should have seen that one but um I, like I said, I forgot. And you could say that it's also referencing that song since it also does do the similar element with the build up to a different tone and then the change of colors. But I don't know, I kind of feel like it's more ripping off of Anastasia and the fact that it's all kind of swirling around and going up all ominous. It just kind of reminds me a little bit of the scene when Rasputin's summoning his dark minions. But either way, it's not very original also if you want a real nitpick this kind of seems like the wrong shade of green to use for evil it looks more like turquoise so unless hatsune miku is the evil overlord behind that book it just kind of seems off most greens used for evil are a little bit more of a central neutral green or yellow green this one just seems a little too bluish Again, probably nitpick, but patience lost. Anyway, Asha returns back home after retrieving her grandfather's wish. She escapes when Mag Stupido was singing his song. She then goes back home, gives her grandfather the wish, and upon receiving it back, he's grateful, and we have a happy moment. The emotions are okay, I guess. I'm not gonna lie, there's nothing really wrong with this scene. It didn't make me cry, but I at least did believe it, and let's face it, unless it's one of those tearful mommy and me moments, there just isn't much to make me cry. My heart is just too cold. This its not the film's fault, I've just been exposed to life. We'll see the temperatures are still fluctuating, but the chances of death have stabilized at about 99.99%. So going back to the map here, sweet glory. And Twitter. All this, however, is then interrupted by Max Stupido, who found out that Asha was behind everything. He then crushes Asha's mother's wish right in front of them, 
for payback and the mother kind of gets knelt over in grief she definitely seems distraught by this it doesn't really answer if it's also painful but i guess it could be griefs painful or whatever he then realizes that by crushing the wishes he gets more power why wouldn't he know that i feel like that's something that would have been written in the book but for some reason he didn't know it Anyway, the star tries to fight back, and Mag Stupido then tries to take it. Asha, the star, and her family then escape. They escape. Why'd you let him escape? How'd you let him escape? You have a woman who's knelt over in grief and maybe pain, a teenage girl, and a man who's a hundred. I feel like you could have caught them, Magnifico, but you didn't. And so, Asha and her family escape via boat, and they row away with the help of Star. You then get a nice visual of them out on the clear sea at night on the boat. And then, one family pep talk later, and Asha swims back and tries to stop Mag Stupido. She then discovers that the one who sold her out to Mag Stupido was one of her seven stupid friends. Don't worry, it wasn't the one who helped earlier, the one who had the most screen time and character. It was the one in the background, who only had really two moments of dialogue, and that was just to remind us that he already gave his wish up to Mag Stupido. Which, on another side note, if not for that one seven stupid friend, we wouldn't really know what it was like to be without a wish. I mean, Asha's grandfather and her mother and presumably everybody else in the kingdom who was over 18 who all had their wishes given up seems to be fine. I mean, maybe a little bit sad here and there for some of them, but for the most part, they all seem fine. And it just doesn't really seem so bad. And yeah, her... Seven stupid friend definitely says, I haven't been the same or I'm boring now and I feel so dr You're based off of sleepy. You'd be drowsy and boring even if you did have your wish. I'm sorry if that seems cold, but it's just not selling the point. Back to the plot. The seven stupid friend who betrayed Asha then gets his wish granted by Mag Stupido and he becomes a loyal knight just like he always wanted. However, he's now loyal to Mag Stupido because, you know, Mag Stupido is the king and so he becomes a loyal pawn. Asha then realizes that during this ceremony, the queen looks upset and for some reason she realizes that it must only be because of the way the king's acting and no other reason. I wish they would have gone back to the original idea of them being a couple villain. Asha then sends one of her talking animals to, t to tell the queen that Asha can help in kind of like a coded message. Asha then goes to rally her friends. Cue new song and then Queenie joins. Uh, side note number 50. How old is the queen? Is she as old as Max Stupido? Because we know Max Stupido has to be old. I mean, he has to be old if he took Asha's grandfather's wish. There's nothing that's stating that he took the wish more recently, so presumably he took Asha's grandfather's wish when he was 18, which would have been 82 years ago. So, that would make Max Stupido very old. Is she also very old? Or did he marry young? That's kind of weird. This would all make more sense to me if they were both still villains because then I would have just assumed they did everything together. <sighs> Why didn't you go with that idea, Disney? Anyway, I'll talk more about this song's failures in the song portion of the review. You know, like how I keep on saying I'll do that. And uh, I will say, though, that I do have to talk about the visuals because the visuals right here are really not selling the urgency that this scene requires. The song, despite its own flaws, is selling the urgency, but the visuals are not. I mean, if they're seen banging on stuff like it's drums and this is the trash in the camp scene from Tarzan, which it's not, then it's not selling the urgency. And if they're not doing the drum banging, then they're chasing the star around and doing like a silly dilly game. and. Ugh, this is not the time for games. And I mean, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a Disney song that this has happened. That you have a moment of urgency and they're just doing stupid stuff like this. 
Some of this is them preparing, but it's just kind of random preparations. It doesn't really explain it, at least upon first viewing. I didn't really understand what they were doing. But ever since it's just them playing glow tag and banging on drums like they're background drummers to a Lindsay Sterling music video. And none of this is necessary, and it just loses all sense of urgency. Again, like I said, they are seen doing some preparation, and yeah, it could be on me for not understanding what they're doing. I gotta recheck that scene. And yes, I just rechecked it, and no, none of it makes sense. They're just building up models of, like, the kingdom and playing games, and it's all very, very stupid. I mean, at the beginning, the shadows kind of made sense because it was also trying to make a point, but that quickly just becomes nonsensical stuff. And I've never seen a song that does this. The closest one that I can think of would be Savages from Pocahontas. And yes, they were beating on drums, but those were the drums of war. And they were beating on them as they were moving towards war. And that was also something that people actually really did back in the time. So yeah, the scene's visuals suck. Okay, so I've pretty much established that I hate the scene and everything about it. Actually, no, I could actually go on and on and on because I'm just loaded with ammunition. I cannot emphasize how much this scene does not work and re-watching it did not help it at all. It just made it worse. But instead of going on and on, I will go on to the next scene because I want this review to end. So, the next scene, they plan on getting King Mag Stupido away from the Wish Vault room. They then use Asha as bait while the now six stupid friends go to set the wishes free with the help of Star. Queenie then informs Mag Stupido of Asha being seen and he should probably go send all of his men and himself to go get her, and he does. Star, before parting ways with Asha, gives her a magic wand. See, with the stick in the hood, she's just like the fairy godmother even more. Get it? References! That will make us seem clever! Oish. Future edit, I actually did put it together on why they made Asha be a reference to the fairy godmother and not the blue fairy, even though to me the blue fairy would make more thematic sense. And that is because... They probably had trouble making her reference the Blue Fairy over the Fairy Godmother in being that the Blue Fairy wears more of a distinct dress and it's kind of low cut and they probably didn't want to put Asha in that. And then also you would have the big wings and stuff so they probably were like, we can't really figure out how to make Asha referencing the Blue Fairy without making it her in an outfit that looks like the Blue Fairy and they probably didn't want to do that. So yeah, I guess that's probably why. So because of that they chose the Fairy Godmother. But um, yeah, that's still not really, that's still not really the best in my opinion. Asha then makes her escape from King Mag Stupido and all of his men and she uses the magic wand to aid her in this by making produce grow. See? Just like the Fairy Godmother. Anyway, it doesn't matter because she's cornered by King Mag Stupido. However, it turns out that this is actually not King Mag Stupido, but the traitor seven stupid friend who betrayed her. And the real Mag Stupido actually stayed behind. And for some reason, he let the now six stupid friends free all of the wishes so he could then absorb the star into the staff. Why did you let them die? do that. It even took them a long time to even figure out how to even free the wishes because they kept messing it up. So why would you give them the illusion of victory? Why haven't you won yet? You are the most powerfulest person in Rosas, I'm pretty sure, and at the castle because Asha's all the way not at the castle. You're the only person with magic, period. Yeah, sure, the star has magic, but we've never seen the star actually use magic in a way that would actually be able to really help itself outside of giving Asha a wand, which the wand has to be used by somebody else. So why haven't, why hasn't Magnifico won yet? This doesn't make sense. You could have just trapped them all and absorbed the star without even risking the wishes going free. Anyway, Mag Stupido is now even more powerful, traps everyone's in vines, you get it more references to Sleeping Beauty, because references is all we've got as a company, is referencing things that were greater than us. 
Asha then comes back pretty quickly. She then tries to stop Mag Stupido, but she fails and she's caught up in the vines. She's then thrown down and then on the ground she then starts singing and then everyone else starts singing and honestly it kind of sounds like bad Hillsong worship music. More on the music in just a minute. Almost done with this abomination. Everyone then unites the star within themselves because remember we're all stars and we all have the power to make our own wishes come true. Magic light, star comes out from the staff. Max Stupido is then sucked into his own staff for some reason, it's not really explained. And everyone else has their wishes returned to them to grant their own wishes. Asha's seven stupid friends who betrayed her then apologize her to her. It's a good apology, nothing more to say, moving on. Anyway, more references upon references because that's all modern Disney can do is reference classic Disney, which was made by more better men and women that they can't even hope to match on their best days. A reference to Peter Pan and Wendy, which, yeah, they made Wendy's wish here being the ability to fly, and I never really saw that being Wendy's main wish, I mean, that seemed more like it would be Peter Pan's wish in the show Once Upon a Time. That basically was his wish in the end. I mean, in the movie, Wendy did enjoy flying, don't get me wrong, but it seemed like she enjoyed it no more than any of the ever cast, like her brothers and the ever lost boys. But here, they just flat out made her wish flying, and Peter Pan's wish is to create a flying machine. What? Is this because of the flying boat? Whatever, I'm probably putting too much thought into this. It's not them, it's just a reference. It's just a reference, so move on. Max Stupido is sealed up in the gem that was on top of his staff and basically becomes the magic mirror from Snow White. Yay! Queen sure did turn on her husband fast. <laughs> Whatever. Love and marriage means absolutely nothing to the people who make Disney. Why am I thinking about it? It's not like they made vows to, you know, honor, love, respect, stay with each other to death to part. He broke it first. He became evil. So it's not no big deal that she lost her spouse. She just moves on and gets over it and is all happy. She gets to rule the kingdom all by herself. So I guess it's now queendom. So what does it even matter? Happy ending for everybody. Except for Max Stupido, who doesn't deserve it because he was evil. And it's all happy. Everyone's got their wishes back. Which, yeah, me and my brother both agree that the wishes that were crushed, like Asha's mother's wish and a few other the townspeople's, those wishes should have just not been given back. And then you could have maybe left those to be the wishes that Asha would have to grant. Because, yes, magic wands in hand cloak over her dress, Asha is basically the fairy godmother. Well, in action, not in appearance, obviously. Because if she was the same fairy godmother, boy did she go for a drastic change. Obviously I'm joking, I know it's not the same fairy godmother. It's probably like how in the TV show Once Upon a Time there was a group of like fairy godmothers and blue fairies and stuff and there was probably, you know, one specific clear head. So yeah, we'll just leave it at that. The credits then roll showing different characters from each of the 62 featured animated films that are made up of gold dust and it's nice enough to you realize that they totally forgot about Meet the Robinsons, which means they either forgot it on purpose because, I don't know, they hate John Lasseter and he helped on that film, or because they couldn't even remember because they were in such a rush to get this film out that they couldn't keep things on track. Speaking of tracks, let's finally roast this music. Over time, Disney songs have always started to move towards being a little bit more pop fish in their style. I mean, there was always those exceptions with the non-diegetic songs that featured in films like Tarzan, Brother Bear, and Treasure Planet. However, now they're just starting to become flat out pop songs that are even in their musical movies. Even up to Frozen, songs have always been in more of their timeless Broadway styles. However, when Moana started coming along, they started moving towards sounding a little bit more popish. And then when Encanto came along, if I remember correctly, uh, do correct me if I'm wrong, 
songs like Surface Pressure was even written by a pop music writer. And in my opinion, Surface Pressure, at the very least, it definitely sounded more popish. And to me, it was the weakest song in that film. I didn't really care for it. And I know my brother definitely didn't like it. Now, I love music. I love music to a dangerous degree. I learned last year in 2023 that I value my time and sanity more than I do money. And then I found out that I value music more than my time and sanity because I spent so many hours just playing around with my music, making sure that each of my playlists were in perfect order right after I got my new PC. And like I said, I wasted a lot of time and sanity just trying to get everything just straight. So yeah, I like music, but I'm not a musical expert. And any degree am I not a musical expert. But like I said in my Willy Wonka video, just because I'm not a musical expert, I do know when something sounds not quite right. There are quite a couple of videos that explain why the songs in this film just doesn't work and they explain it way more musically analytical than I ever could explain it, so I recommend checking out those. I will say that one of the biggest issues that I had myself, I picked up on this without anyone having to tell me it, and that is the songs in these newer films, the lyrics are very vague. And I believe it is to appeal to more of I guess older kids who don't want to listen to specific story music however I'd say that this will probably fall flat on its face in the long term due to how timeless ever Disney songs can be regardless of how specific they are to the story. And like I said earlier King Mag Stupido's villain song is the worst. I couldn't get my brother to say this when recording the review for his channel because he's being too obtuse and annoying like he usually is. But, at one time, when he was younger, he did say that he never really cared for The Lion King or any of its songs, but despite that, he did like the song Be Prepared. Everyone likes a good villain song. Villains should always have one of the best, if not the best, song in the film. I can even think of non-Disney villains that this applies to. Villains always have a cool song, and yet, Meg's Stupido's villain song doesn't even sound like a villain song. It just sounds like some kind of pop song. Its riveting pattern is so off. And then we have the infamous line. I let you live it for free and I don't even charge you rent. Oof, that is just bad. Enough said on that one. And as for the rest of the songs, <laughs> well... Like I said earlier, the star one was bad. I think it's just as bad in rhythm and lyrics, and the beat just seemed generally off. Get back to your system! Some of the time. But I don't think it is as bad as Is This the Thanks I Get, just because I feel like that song failed on a more grander scale so it made it worse and in the end the star song was just an annoying middle song kind of like uh fixer upper was the i want song this wish does sound nice enough in its melody and is catchy but the lyrics are just so vague it doesn't really even tell you anything that specific about asha it doesn't really explain her emotions that good and it doesn't even really match with what happens in the plot it's not moving the plot forward it's just there to be a nice song so the only thing it really has going for it is it's a nice song that has a good enough melody and ariana's de Bose's, sorry if i pronounced your name wrong it sounds very good on vocals however you can't really hear her that much this wish and knowing what i know now just sounded really off the background music was way too loud at some points almost as loud as the vocals and i actually had trouble hearing her this movie did debose again sorry if i mispronouncing your name 
no favors in showcasing her singing ability because you couldn't hear her sing half the time. And it's even worse in the song Knowing What I Know Now. Like I said earlier, this song does sell the urgency that was required for the moment, but it had its ever flaws. And to me, that flaw was that the drums were way too loud. Maybe this is because the songs are set to a certain type of surround sound and my speakers just don't have that ability to pick it up, but if that's the case, you should have accounted for this. My TV only has one speaker, but I think a lot of people only have one speaker in their house, and I definitely know my computer setup is very normal. Same thing with my phone, and it sounded way too loud on all of them. You can also hardly hear the queen either. The beat is just way too imposing. If this was just me and maybe I just got a crappy phone, crappy speakers, and crappy TV speakers, let me know. I am very curious to know what you think and if you could hear it. Also, in the case of this song, the only ones who sounded good were Asha and the Queen. Everyone else just kind of sounded meh in my opinion, especially the male characters. And this is sad because this probably would have been my favorite song from the film, but it got ruined by the fact, at least on my speaker setup, the drums were way too loud. And besides the Queen and Asha, all of the Ever Singers just kind of sounded really bleh. I think one big reason for this is the fact that a lot of them are at least playing more comedical characters and they have more of a novelty voice going on for them, which sounds really good if it was the kind of song like I've Got a Dream from Disney's Tangled that was sung by the Pub Fugs, and they really did fit in that song. However, this is a high tension song with a lot of urgency, and you have these more comedical voices singing it. Extra side note, you can get a more comical voice to sing a serious song. You can do this, but I think to pull it off, you need a character to be a character first, someone that I am invested in, or at the bare least, like their presence, so that way I will not mind their singing not quite matching the tone that you are going for. And then it isn't helped by the fact that 90% of the visuals in this song is spent showing them just goofing off. Which again, isn't held by the fact that you already have more comical performances from most of the characters. That combined with the actions just make all urgency and seriousness that the film is trying to convey go out the window. And you can't say, well it's a kids film so it's best to not take it too seriously because it's just for kids. That's not the right outlook to have and definitely not an outlook that classic Disney films would have. Serious moments that required urgency were treated with seriousness and gave you the feeling of urgency. In the scene Tangled, do you really think the moment when Eugene is rushing back to save Rapunzel would be quite as epic and urgent if the pub bugs him and Max were singing in the background and just doing goofy things all the way there. It wasn't like there wasn't any humor in the scene, but it wasn't without purpose either. They were saving Eugene and fighting the guards. The humor was just something that was happening as they were doing that. And they weren't singing while they were doing it either. Also, once Eugene gets on the horse and is actually on his way there, the humor and goofy tone just goes completely away, and it allows the scene to build up in its serious nature. That's why it works, and also why this one does not. Its visuals and actions were consistent with the tone that the film was trying to convey, and since it was consistent, it succeeded. This wasn't, so it failed, at least in my opinion. Now, naturally, this is a song moment, so I'm not saying the singing should just go away nor do I want it to go away with all honesty. There's a lot in this song that I do like and could have worked, but you could have done better at it, Disney. There is actually a song that Disney did do that did everything that I wanted from this song, 
in it perfectly. And believe it or not, it's actually from the Tangled TV series. Now, I haven't watched the Tangled TV series, but I am semi-aware of the plot. And I did see some of the songs. And the one that I am referring to that did everything right in it was Ready As I'll Ever Be. Which is a really good song. I love it a lot. If you haven't heard it, give it a listen to. And again, it did everything that this song was attempting to do in it with all of the urgency and even the preparation perfectly. And I wasn't even aware of most of the characters when I first heard that song and it still worked. Anyway, back to the main script. You were this close to getting me to actually care about this song and even put it in my music collection, but hey, you failed. You had one shot and you failed. But at least this one and I Make This Wish were at least memorable, which is more than I could say about the Evers. Yeah, I only heard them once, but I only heard the main songs from the 2023 Wonka film, and I remember those better. Oh, and like I said, this Wish reprise just kind of sounds like Hillsong United worship music. Like, for real, that's the vibe I got. Also, the idea of defeating a villain with song is just stupid in my opinion. It's very childish, and it's something that Disney has never done before. They haven't even really had music being sung at the main climax, let alone have a song be what defeats the villain. This might work in a plot that's more centered around the music. Like the Little Mermaid prequel film. Music was a strong theme in that film. It was even a directed DVD prequel and way more goofy and even that didn't end with the villain being defeated by music. But in this type of plot, it just really comes off dumb in my opinion. Like, if this was a Broadway musical, or like a movie that's more of a musical musical, it might work. Barbie in the Diamond Castle is actually an example where this did work because it was heavily centered around music, not just in theme, but also the villain used a musical flute. So it made sense for them to defeat the villain with music. Not also that, Barbie has always defeated her villains in various different of ways. Sometimes just by preaching dumb feminist talking points about the patriarchy. But not a Disney musical, because animation, you are allowed to resort to actually showing cool fight scenes or battles or whatever, because you can actually do that, so you don't need to fall back on the music to have it'd be your climax but that's what they did and like i said it just kind of comes off dumb in my opinion and in the end i'm not putting any of this music on my phone and i even have a song from frozen 2 on there and i hated that film in case you're wondering it's show yourself for the sake of sheep i even have some songs on there from rachel zegler from the hunger games movie it's not like i have a high standard for music but yet you could not pass it, at least for me. Disney direct-to-DVD sequels songs sounded better than the songs from this film. Lion King 2, Cinderella Free, and even Little Mermaid 2 had some nice songs. Yeah, they don't always sound like they're in the same style as their predecessors, but they at least sounded nice. Which, yeah, let's talk about the main characters now. Starting with the main bad guy, because he is without a doubt the worst in this story. I mean, everyone loves a good classic Disney villain. We all adore them. They said that they would be returning to the classical Disney form in this film, since for a long time, all we've really gotten is stupid rush twist villains, and then after that it was generational trauma. I swear if I hear that term again, I'm gonna catch something. It's not like there's anything wrong with it, but ooh, I'm sick of it. Let's face it, there was no way anybody was going to be remembering the sheep from Zootopia, and Hans from Frozen, he ain't going up at any top 10 Disney villain list. So yeah, we needed a classic Disney villain to return. However, instead, we got this pathetic schlop. Let's first start with his design, because I'm an artist. Designs are everything in my opinion. Now as a king, he's great. 
he looks like your ideal king. They obviously did this on purpose. However, what Disney should have done was transform him and give him a more menacing design once he went bad. There is actually an example of what Wish was attempting to do here, only it was done perfectly in its film, and believe it or not, it's from Disney's Marvel with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Ego is a lot like Magnifico. He starts out as a godly slash ruler slash bobber figure with hints of a strong ego right from the get-go, all the way down to the ridiculous name. Still, he looks like the ideal image he's trying to convey, in Ego's case, a god slash bobber figure. However, with Ego towards the end, he goes from his first design into turning into a monster in some scenes. He's also constantly being seen destroyed and then putting himself back together again, which really does sell the creepiness that he does have to him. And then at the end, his skin has become paler, his eyes are more creepier, and he just seems to be falling apart. He's got a more horrific design, which is fitting to his true nature, which is a horrific character. And this was a Marvel villain, not even trying to be a classic Disney villain like this was. And yet, it succeeded infinitely better. I believe that Disney did this because they want you to associate the image of an ideal king as someone who can be bad. And the tropes that you would use for an ideal villain should not always be associated with being a villain. A charitable way to look at this is Disney doesn't want kids to judge a book by its cover. A more hostile view to look towards this is that men who are more of the traditional kings are just bad because men and we can't make a villain attire be associated with evil because goth kids or something, I don't know. People who wear horns or call them the powers of hell aren't evil. So why should we associate them with evil? But I don't know. I'm going to give Disney the more charitable benefit of the doubt. And even if you want to do it on the sense of you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, it still fails. Why? Because he's trying to be a traditional Disney villain. If he's trying to be a traditional Disney villain, then he needs to look like a Disney villain. Jafar, Ursula, Scar, Radcliffe, Cruella, Lady Tremaine, Maleficent, even Gaston, who starts off looking more like a trad male hero. You know, like the one Magnifico was trying to be at the start. Still has elements that make him look more villainous. He has dark hair, harsh eyes that just pop out overpowering movement and rough angles and towards the end his hair comes undone and he's wearing a dark cloak and that really does contrast with the beast who's now drawn more kinder and softer compared to when you first saw him you could say in the end this is all just baseline eye assumptions and we as humans should not be making those types of assumptions but in the end that doesn't matter because that is how animation works and the reason animation functions in that way is because no matter what people say or do that is how humans work that is how we will always work we see and we hear things and we make judgments again it's not always right our judgments aren't always right and we shouldn't be judging people solely off of the way they look. Obviously not. But in animation, this is helpful to actually do this, especially when working with kids shows. Because you are not just telling a story with words or even music, but also animation. And animation is built upon the way things look. It just turns him into being a lame twist villain we all could have seen coming and now he's just put on speed. And in the end, when he is evil, it just seems so rushed and disconnected. This isn't helped by giving him some sorry excuse of a backstory which is barely expanded upon. It's like when you gave Gaston that little detail of him having served in the war and having PTSD in that awful Beating the Beast live action remake. Was there a point to this? I really don't think there was outside of the fact that Disney and the chumps who are running it now don't understand the concept of evil. and. 
even if it's an easy target like a straight white male, they still can't do it. Which doesn't surprise me that Disney can't understand evil. I firmly believe when you break everything down to its most rawest form of archetype, you are left with three types of villain. The first being the tragic villain. Typically, someone who is misunderstood or had something happen to them in the present time of their story, or someone who was set down their path of villainy due to a set of unfortunate events that happened before your story began. Think of characters like Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender or Akito from the anime Fruits Basket. The second type is a force of nature villain, someone who does not have much going for them outside of being an all-powerful and vague force of ultimate evil to your story, doing evil because it's more of their default nature and instinct than their own personal desire. More of a concept than a character. Think of characters like Chernabog from Disney's Fantasia or Sharptooth from The Land Before Time. And the third type of villain would be the good old scenery chewing, mustache twirling bad guy who is evil because they love being evil. They might have a deeper motivation for them to be evil, but you can be downright sure that that motivation is either selfish petty or comes from a twisted view on the way that they think the world most absolutely should be. All these can be done good or bad. I've seen examples of movies where they work and examples of movies where they do not work. Neither is better than the ever. I think some people are more preset to automatically think that the tragic villain is automatically more better than the latter due to that type of villain making for of a more interesting character because they're more complex and thus have more going for them. However, you can give a character depth while also making them an unforgivable evil for evil's sake villain. Sometimes you can't even redeem that villain. The redemption arc is just not solely for the tragic villain. It can be given to these types of villain as well. Think of characters like Darth Vader. Just as a tragic villain is not always forgiven. Think of characters like Ramses from The Prince of Egypt. Or you could just let the evil loving bad guy be evil. But no matter what type of villain you pick, the key to making this villain great is finding the one that works best for your story and then give them a good story. And if you're not a good writer, then it doesn't matter what you do because it's gonna suck. You need to be a good writer. Disney has most commonly chosen the evil loving bad guy type of villain. Pretty much all of its 62 main films have been this archetype of bad guy. And for the most part, they are all handled great. I mean, if you do just limit it to the 62 main animated films, then you will find more that are liked than disliked. Some of them are a bit more complex, like Claude Frollo, and Evers are not, like the Evil Queen. Some are awesome and remembered forever, like Maleficent and Scar, while Evers are just forgotten, like Shere Khan and Radigan. And some are just not good like at all, like Alamanda Slim from Home on the Range. But for the most part, Disney has been known to handle these villain types quite good in its past days, as, like I said, most of them have been more positive than bad. Not saying that there weren't any bad villains that were handled poorly before Disney's wish, but I really think that when it comes down to Mag Stupido, the reason why he failed is a little bit different than the Evers. And that is because I feel like he kind of tried to be all three archetypes at once. And because of this, he failed. Did you know that there was actually a movie that not only handled all three types of these villains, pretty flawlessly, simultaneously, but was also a million times better than this film and also came out recently, and by recently I mean the same exact year that this film came out, and by saying that you 
pretty much already know what I'm gonna say. Puts in boots in the last wish. <laughs> they both have wish in their last name. But yes, wish did this, I mean, the last wish did this perfectly. You have Goldilocks and her free bears who are the sympathetic villain. Yes, they start getting less and less villainous as the story progresses and by the end they really aren't villains at all, but for a majority of the story they are the antagonists of the film nonetheless. Jack Horner is the enjoy being evil bad guy, which is probably why he was so loved just because of how evil he was. And then finally you have Death, which is a force of nature type of villain. like. Literally, that is what death is in that film, a force of nature. And then, in November corner of the movie sec, you have Max Stupido. And, okay, I will be honest, I feel like the idea of him being the force of nature villain is a little bit of a stretch, and that's probably just me thinking that. But, I don't know, I feel like there were moments where they were kind of going for that. But, for the most part... I mean, he's in the bland, neutral state that never really seems to go all the way outside of some random moments where he screams to the top of his lungs and has bombastic animation to him. And it's just all over the place and kind of random, where as someone like Jafar and Scar both had a purpose behind their m manacle screaming, this cartoon character it just seems like he's kind of all over the place and he actually seems no joke this cartoon character looks like someone who is acting to be a bad guy and desperately wanting the oscar not chris pine the actual mag stupido that's what he came off as and like i said you just have moments where you, they have a little bit of sympathy thrown his way, but then they really just want to try to make him the evil, enjoying evil bad guy, and it just really doesn't work, and I think it makes this villain one of the worst out of all of Disney's 62 main films. And next up, we have our main heroine, Asha. And after doing this review, I probably will try heroin. That's a joke, by the way. And like I said, her character design is pretty solid. I mean, if you judge it on its own independently of the film. So you gotta ignore the fact that her color scheme kind of blends in a little bit too much with the background. The fact that this is the same style that Disney's done since Tangled for over 10 years. And the fact that um, there really is nothing that stands out-ish when you compare her to the rest of the Disney heroines. But, nonetheless, I do like it. It's a fairly solid design. Well, outside of the fact that I really do believe that they were trying to make her hair be that shaved on one side look. And I hate it. But, we'll ignore that and... I think her design, on its own, stands up pretty nicely. I do like it. But, like I've also been saying throughout this entire film, her personality is not. We seem to be stuck in the adorkable face of the heroine. I swear there are moments I cannot even tell the difference between all of these girl characters. Some might say that this was also an issue with the classical era of Disney princesses, but to me, that's just not true. Snow White was actually a lot more stoic than people think. You wouldn't really think stoic, how much she cries, and she definitely seems very much more emotional, but she definitely seems like someone who takes on a scary ordeal and doesn't complain. Like, yes, she is emotional, but she's not really complaining, she just takes things on the cheek and always looks on the bright side and being that ray of hope in a gray day. Meanwhile, Cinderella is someone who is more of a realistic type. She is frustrated with her position, but she knows she can't do anything about it because she's been conditioned to be this way from a young age. Which people seem to forget! And yet, 
Despite this conditioning at a young age, Cinderella has made sarcastic remarks about her sisters behind their back and she even seems to take a little bit of glee when they are in their frustration. And I really do think that speaks to the levels of depth that she actually had. I mean, she wasn't the um, Mariana Trench levels of depth when it came to characters, but considering the fact that she has been conditioned to be submissive and she does have these elements that are a little bit more fiery, I really think that she definitely has more going for her than people give her credit for and it goes unnoticed by so many people who watch this film. And then next, you have Best Girl Aurora from Sleeping Beauty, who's my favorite from the classical era. Now, Aurora is living a much more simpler and also privileged life, so to speak, when you compare her to Cinderella and Snow White. Now, in one aspect, she's a little bit more tragic in the fact that she has a curse and she's been robbed of her prince's lifestyle. She does not know that she is the heir to the throne. However, she doesn't know that. So she is the one with the best lifestyle out of all three of these girls. So because of that, she is more elegant out of the three, at least I think so, and she's got more time to actually be focused on love, which is a bad thing for her, even though Philip is also the same, but people seem to ignore that. She's also a lot more laid back, a lot more simpler, I will admit, but I do think that there was a lot more going for the character that people just don't really seem to acknowledge. I also think that there's a thing, a big factor that a lot of people aren't acknowledging for the more classical era of Disney films and I'll get to that in a minute. But my point is from Snow White to Tiana, each one of the girls were different. Now, some of them weren't drastically different, but at the same time, you couldn't get any of them mixed up. At least, I believe you couldn't. They each had drastically different silhouettes, different backgrounds, different voice mannerisms, different singing styles, different reactions, and different temperaments. They weren't all deep, but this was also because part of the point of the more earlier films was in Disney's collection, was to give people a more emotional, heartfelt experience over a logical, consistent story. And this wasn't bad. I know people think this is bad, but it wasn't because that's what people wanted to see in that time, and people enjoyed it, and I know they enjoyed it because these films were successful. And if they weren't successful, then we wouldn't have the Disney company that is now a hundred years old. I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth in this later on, but for now, let's just say the films were more meant to feed the heart more than the mind. But starting from the Disney Renaissance era of films, they then started making changes to each one of their princesses to reflect more modern ideas of the time, and they tried to give them more depth than they previously had. Most of this depth involved going out and exploring slash learning to be daring, brave, and more rebellious, not afraid to let her voice be heard. That was a positive for a female character, and yet, for some reason, since they fall in love with a guy, we gotta throw all that progress out the window, it doesn't count. Yes, I'm salty. And now, we're at the stage where Disney wants to give their heroines even more depth and personality, but yet, they're still very similar to each other. Now, yes, there are differences, but there are way too many similarities. And maybe this would have flied if it wasn't for the fact that Disney is bragging how their princesses and heroines are more better versus the ones of the past, even though they have the same issue that people accuse the Disney princesses from the classical era of being way too similar, only now it's worse because they're saying that they don't have that issue, even though they do. And I said how this made sense for Rapunzel, so I'm not gonna diss her, because she was the first, and since she was the first, this was new for them. 
no one else was quite like her, at least yet. You could say by some extent this also made sense for Anna due to her being sheltered as well. And despite the flaws that I have with the film Frozen as I look at it now as an adult, Anna does work a little bit better than most of the modern Disney heroines if I am being honest. One reason behind this is because she is balanced out quite nicely by her sister Elsa who is more calm, elegant, and well cold. Pun not intended. And it does make sense to have one sister be cold and closed off and then to contrast this with having the younger sister being more warm and open. And I like that contrast. However, I am going to counter the defense of Anna's personality being totally justified in her adorable like ways because I'm going to bring up this fact and that is just because Anna had a bit of a similar lifestyle to Rapunzel, that doesn't mean she act the exact same way. Now, one statement I made just five seconds ago was that each one of the older Disney princesses all had different backgrounds. Now, some pleb might say, oh, well that was true with some of the Disney princesses, but some of them were the exact same. They were each perfect princesses who were princesses from their entire life and they had perfect lives and they were just sick of being princesses and they longed for a man. And no, they were different. And I'm going to go through that right now and I'm going to use the example of Jasmine and Ariel, two princesses that one might think at first glance are similar because they both have the fact that they were princesses their entire life, they both have fathers who are older, and they both long to leave their princess life. But let's inspect these two girls a little bit more on a closer level. As for Jasmine, her problem is that she has no real friends outside of her tiger Raja. She doesn't even seem to have any servants. Now, obviously, this isn't very realistic at all. She would most presumably have handmaidens, but they wanted to show you that she's alone. So to show this point, they threw realism out the window and just had her have no handmaidens because they wanted to sell the idea that she is alone. The only ones who are seen at the castle are her guards and she has no relationship with them whatsoever and that is what she wants a relationship and she never even states that this relationship has to be with a man she just wants it with someone and the reason why she can't have a true relationship is because she is a princess so because of that she laments being a princess and she laments being trapped in her home so this causes her to leave as for ariel she does not have this problem. She has friends in Flounder and Scuttle and also seven sisters. She can't be alone if she's living with seven sisters. And for Ariel, loneliness is not her problem. They never once state that that is her problem ever in the movie. Her problem is that she is curious and she wants to learn about things. And what more better thing to learn about than the world that she is kept away from. And she can only experience this world through the ships that sink down into the ocean. And it is this desire to learn more about the surface world that is then pushed by the fact of her father's outburst that causes her to leave her home. She never laments about being alone because that's not her issue. Her and Jasmine have two separate issues and two separate reasonings for leaving their home. Also, Jasmine, for the most part, has a good relationship with her father. Her father is very perky and happy and he's a very fun character. Triton is loving and stern, but he's also that scary dad. I mean, he used to terrify me when I was little. So both girls have very different relationships with their father to boot. So that's a never difference. And of course, a never motivation for Ariel leaving, of course, is Eric because he represents everything that she sees the surface world for being. Beautiful and exciting and just something new. So there's a never difference. As for Jasmine, she looks at Aladdin because 
he helped her and that's the positive trait that she sees in him she also then sees a never positive and him being that he feels the same way that she does trapped in a world that he did not ask for so the complete relationship that they have with their love interest is also different so those are three big differences throughout their entire story and they are reflected quite well within their story both girls act and react differently according to their personality and their story their personality is shaped by their story but the way that their story moves forward is only because of their personality shaping the choices that they make and even though they do have the same end result of them resenting their home and leaving their home it is for different reasons and then once they do leave their home they both have different reactions to the outside world. Jasmine's a little bit more cautious and a little bit more nervous about being seen and very naive on how the world works. Ariel is naive on how the world works, but she's very open, very curious, and ready to just explore everything. So these two girls are not the same. There's also a lot more you could also dive into, but that's just what I came up with off the top of my head. Literally, this entire princess part of the rant is actually not scripted at all. Now, story beat-wise, there is a lot of differences between Rapunzel and Anna. The problem between Rapunzel and Anna comes in the fact that despite their stories being different, their responses to their story are not. And in the case of Anna, they don't even seem appropriate all the time. So even if Anna was first in the line of adorable heroines, she still would not work in my opinion. And it really does seem to be the only reason why they did this is because they were copying Rapunzel because it worked so well then. Disney has always done things that have worked. They've repeatedly done Disney princesses because that has been a very successful thing for them. However, like I explained with Jasmine and Ariel, even when they did the same thing, they still made changes. They still knew they had to do something different each time even if it was the same thing. Whereas Anna just seems to be the same thing as Rapunzel. Now let me explain further in depth of what I'm talking about here so I can really bring home the point that I'm trying to make. And the reason why I'm talking so much about Frozen and Anna in my Disney's Wish review of the portion where I'm supposed to be talking about Asha is because this entire adorable phase started with Frozen and Anna, not Tangled and Rapunzel. And I will not let Rapunzel and Tangled be blamed for the sins of Anna and Frozen. Rapunzel's whole story starts when Mother Gothel stole her away as a baby from her parents and her real home. Rapunzel is then made to believe that Mother Gothel is her only true mother and this tower is Rapunzel's only true safe haven and the real world is scary and dangerous. However, Rapunzel has always had a longing to see the stars that only appear on her birthday up close and personal because she knows there must be something more to them in the fact that they only show up for her birthday. This passion and desire to see those stars up close and personal finally gets so big that she then has enough courage to convince Flynn or Eugene to be her GPS to take her there. And once she is outside of her tower, she's very conflicted at first, like very conflicted, due to the fact that Mother Gothel has spent her entire life being very emotionally abusive and manipulative towards Rapunzel. And Rapunzel wants to be a good daughter because she is a good person. So she's not quite sure of what to do, but nonetheless, the desire to go see the stars is something that is very strong in her and she will see this no matter what. Now Anna is living trapped and isolated in her home as well just like Rapunzel however it wasn't by a fake parent it was by her real parents and then it is continued by her sister after her parents tragic death 
Granted, they open it up for one day for Elsa's coronation, but both sisters make it clear in the song for the first time in forever, this will only be for one day, and Elsa cannot wait to get the gates closed again. And so, Anna has been living pretty much all alone, and what's even worse is that her sister, Elsa, has locked herself away from Anna because she doesn't want to hurt Anna with her powers. But Anna does not remember that because the trolls took her memory away, which makes the trolls the worst Disney characters in my opinion. Which already makes her situation different from Rapunzel. But there's more. Anna, despite living an isolated life, hasn't been completely closed off from humanity. There are a lot of servants shown to be at this castle, and she's not seen interacting with these servants, but presumably she's not on bad terms with the servants like Jasmine was with her guards. As for Rapunzel, outside of Mother Gothel, she's had no human interaction, and the only interaction she's had just in general has been with her chameleon, Pascal, who once again, thankfully, does not talk. He just makes a bunch of cute expressions. So Anna is not completely alone. Now my problem isn't the fact that Anna isn't completely alone. My problem is, is that despite the differences in Anna's story to Rapunzel and the fact that she has dead parents, her sister has completely abandoned her, continues to abandon her when her parents die, which would be a very delicate and tragic time in Anna's life, and the fact that the gates are closed by family members that she loves, her only family members. So that should make her already different from Rapunzel, but yet she seems to react to everything in the same way as Rapunzel. And so because of that, it just feels like they're doing these things because it was successful with Rapunzel, so we're gonna repeat it with Anna. Now, Disney has repeated things that were successful. The reason why we have so many Disney princesses is because that was a very successful formula. But with each princess, they still made them their own characters and they made them act differently according to their story. I think one way you could have made Anna act different from Rapunzel is maybe make her a little bit more depressed or grieved or even resentful because of her situation, but they didn't do that. Now granted, I can see why you wouldn't want to do those because those aren't very positive ideas for a Disney princess to have, but nonetheless, it would have made her an interesting character and stand out from Rapunzel. And yet, consistently, despite the differences with Anna and Rapunzel's story, Anna responds in a manner very similar to Rapunzel almost throughout pretty much the entirety of her story. These similarities are also not held by the simple fact that both Anna and Rapunzel look similar to each other. Say what you want about how Anna and Rapunzel and Jasmine were all the same and they were just princesses who long for something more, but in the end, each one of them responded differently in their story in a way that was consistent with their personalities that they were given because the creator of their stories took note to the details with in their backgrounds and how those details would make them different and how those differences would shape their personalities. Plus, each one of them looked different. Jasmine was Arabic, so of course that meant she would look different. She had black hair, darker skin, dark eyes. Ariel had bright red hair and blue eyes and Belle had brown hair and hazel eyes. Each one of their visual differences not only reflected each one of the girls' differences' geographic backgrounds, but also their personalities. In Jasmine's case, she wore a bright color scheme that contrasted with her more natural, darker features, which made her look exotic, thus making her look exciting and also fun, while also made her look elegant and beautiful. Meanwhile, Ariel was given a more vibrant and bright color scheme that was complementary to her natural bright features. This gave her a bubbly, fun, outgoing vibe to the character, which matched her bubbly, fun, and curious personality. Her mermaid design reflects this, and the clothes that she wears on the human world reflects this. 
whereas Belle was given a more grounded, realistic color scheme that was not quite as bright as Ariel's, but still an upbeat feeling towards them. Both fit her personality in being more mature, graceful, but still fun and inviting. For Rapunzel, they did put time and effort into her design, and if you look closer at it, you can notice them quite easily. And I'm not going to say that there was no effort, time, or love put into Anna's design, because I just don't know that, so I'm not going to say that. And to be honest, I really don't want to believe that no passion was put into it. But I will state that I personally feel that there wasn't enough originality put into Anna's design, outside of the element of Anna being in a Norwegian environment. So the effort that was put into her design does come off a lot more surface level. They also chose a hair color that looked too similar to Rapunzel's. They should have gone with a uh, dark brown, black, or brighter red to make this distinction between her. And considering each princess looked drastically different in their bodily appearance, so not even counting their clothes, to the point where they each look different from their respective films, I can safely say this is done quite poorly in Frozen. Again, I'm not saying that no work was put into it, but it definitely feels like less. And this continued to be a problem from Anna and onward. And so, Asha just feels like a dry repeat of all the Evergirls we've had over the last 13 years. And in the case of Asha, I think it's probably the worst it's been in a while. Because at least with Maribel and Moana, they were drastically different in their environment. Whereas Asha just seemed to be vaguely European Kingdom style. In that it seems to be a little bit more inspired off of Spain. And that's really all. And outside of Asha's different race, her saying a few Spanish words, and her clothing looking a little bit more Latin American inspired, there really isn't anything making her look that distinct, like at all. And so, there really isn't anything that makes her stand out or pop when set against the ever Disney princesses and heroines outside of her race being different, which isn't bad, that's not a problem at all. But don't we want more for our Disney princess and heroines? And for a long time, this was never a problem. With the older Disney princes and heroines, each one of them had personalities that were consistent with their story, shaped by their story, while also shaping how the story would play out after they arrived in their story. And it was really obvious. I'm not going to say that there weren't any moments for Asha that didn't make sense for her to make that decision or even to have that reaction, but those moments were not distinct enough from each other from previous heroines. Her song was not distinct enough from the ever latest songs we've gotten from Disney. And even her outfit doesn't look that special, especially when you compare it to even more of the recent Disney heroines like Maribel, Elsa, or Moana. Outside of some small details of it looking Latin American, I'm not saying Asha is totally bad but there isn't anything that makes her really that great either. So we spent all of that time just talking about King Max Stupido, Asha, and the problem that is the Disney adorable heroine. So what about the rest of the characters? Well, don't worry, this will not be hard or long since none of them really are characters. Look, I'm not going to pretend that every character in Disney had great depth or their own personal individual arcs because that would be a flat out lie. They didn't. A lot of them didn't have anything really going for them. Because older Disney knew that the main focus of their story was the main character. Sometimes they would extend this to one side character, a love interest, or to some extent, even the villain. One film that did do all three of these was Disney Hercules. Phil, Meg, and Hades each had their own individual issue that was independent from Hercules on the sideline. 
They weren't that big, or nothing really that grandiose, but it was something individual of Hercules and his journey. But this whole situation was a rarer occasion than not. They didn't do this with Flounder, the mice from Cinderella, or all of the servants from Beauty and the Beast. However, despite this, each one of the side characters all at least felt like characters. Now, granted, I only saw this film once. Well, actually, by the time I get done editing this piece, it'll probably be closer to two times. However, once upon a time, 13 years ago, I only saw Rapunzel once, and I was only 13 then. And I remembered all of the main characters' names, and as for the side characters, even if I couldn't remember their names, I still remembered their characters. I even didn't have this problem with Disney's Encanto, and I did only see that film once. There is a reason why I keep calling her seven stupid friends her seven stupid friends, and it's not just because it's a joke, it's because I genuinely can't remember their names. I know that they, they did say their names in the film, but because none of them really had an outstanding character, it didn't push me to remember them, or even care to remember them, to be honest. Which, by the way, there is a lot of characters in this film. You've got the seven stupid friends, the grandfather, the mother, the queen, and the stupid goat. And out of all those characters, the only names that I can remember off the top of my head is Valentino, Asha, King Magnifico, I think one of the seven friends is Dahlia, she was the one who was given the most time, and Sabino, which I'm pretty sure is the grandfather's name. Can't remember any of the other characters' names or anything that distinct about them. Nothing makes them really stand out from ever side characters that I've seen in ever films. And maybe that's just me being stupid. I do have fluff and stuff for brains. But I do feel this would have been helped if they characters felt more memorable, and none of them do, except for Magnifico, and he's for the wrong reason. So, we talked about the music, and now the characters, so what about the animation? Well, considering what got me interested in this film was because of that controversial article I read where the creators of this film were disrespecting 2D animation I just had to check this film out for myself to see what was going to be so amazing in this film that they just couldn't do it in 2D. And I can safely say that now that I've seen it, there was nothing in this film that could have not been done in 2D animation. They also said the star was supposed to be 2D, at least I think they said it, I could be wrong but uh, it, it didn't look 2D. At the bare least, it looked like it had a 2D overlay on it, maybe? Uh, I, it didn't look 2D. Okay, future edit. My brother just informed me that this crappy paper cut of a mascot was in fact not 2D. In the, was going to be, but in the end, Disney couldn't do it and their reasoning was because they did not have the time or manpower to make it 2D, which really does inform me how deep Disney is in its own crap. If a big company like them does not have the time or manpower to do one stupid cookie star cutout shape of a character. And it also takes away that promise that we were left with with this film being a celebration of 2D and 3D animation, the things that made this company what it is. And in the end, all we're left with is 3D animation with a trashy texture over it. Because yeah, like the article said, they put like this watercolor effect over the movie to try to make it seem like it would be 2D and 3D at the same time, but yeah, I was right then when I was reacting to that article, it just makes the film look unfinished and not like Sleeping Beauty, which they claimed it would. Which, 
By the way, Sleeping Beauty wasn't even done with watercolors, or not even done in a traditional watercolor style. It was a style that was reminiscent of the tapestries of the time period that Sleeping Beauty takes place in, or at least close to it. So why do you keep calling it watercolors? Calling this animation anything like the animation of Sleeping Beauty is a joke, especially when you look at Sleeping Beauty's making of video, and at the beginning, you could say that this film's backgrounds are drawn or animated, whatever you want to say, to look like the forest in Sleeping Beauty, but that's the most this film looks like Sleeping Beauty. And that's not because it's a nod to Sleeping Beauty's style, but because they just literally copied it. Great Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep's Enchanted Dominion did that as well. Nothing special. Now yes, the orbs of wishes would have been hard to do in 2D. But, first of all, I think you could do it in 2D, it just wouldn't be to the same extent. But if you wanted to do it in the same swirly move, just use 3D to aid you. Nobody would call your movie not 2D if you just use 3D on the orbs. Anime does that all the time. Disney has done it in the past. You don't drop the whole 2D medium just because you can't do one thing in 2D. But that's what they did. In the end, we've got no 2D animation left, and it's just sad. If you are going to use 3D and say that you are doing things that are more limited by 2D, then really utilize that element. The anime Lands of Lustrous did this pretty good. There are a lot of things in that anime that could not be done in 2D. And there's even some moments where they do use 2D in the anime because they knew 3D wouldn't look right for that scene. There's nothing wrong with using both or using one to aid you. But Disney can't do 2D animation period because there's no one left in the company that even knows how to do 2D animation anymore. And outside of the wish orbs, like I said, there's nothing in this film that you couldn't accomplish in 2D animation. So it's just sad to see them neglect that source of animated medium. And honestly, if Disney was going to do just one of them, it should have been 2D animation since 2D animation was what built up their company from the ground up. It also made 2D animation be seen as a valuable storytelling resource. And I mean, to Disney inspired anime to some degree. I don't know how much you would want to contribute Disney to creating anime, but Somehow we've gotten to the point where Disney doesn't do any 2D animation and all the great 2D animation is from anime, pretty much, with like maybe a few exceptions here and there. But no, in the end it would have been too much to ask Disney, the company that once upon a time actually pioneered 2D animation into becoming a valuable, incredible, beautiful, and legit medium of storytelling to actually try and do 2D animation once again. 2D animation, that is the primary reason for us even having the 3D animation that you are so fond of using these days, because it helped push the technology forward at a faster pace. I'm not going to say that 3D animation would have never existed without 2D animation. I just don't know the answer to that. However, I say that you can't deny that the reason we got 3D animation so quickly is because 2D animated studios like Disney and Evers were constantly pushing the boundaries and trying to create new technology to make greater 2D animated films. Not also that, it did prime people into accepting, you know, non-live action mediums to tell stories. And if you're going to defend Disney by saying it's hard to do 2D animation, which yes, I'm aware it's very hard, I know that it is very hard. However, I'm going to counter that defense by saying, are you telling me that Disney can't even do something that Ever Studios have and still are doing just once for their 100th anniversary and 
an anniversary that they only got because Walt Disney put his money and his men where his mouth was and took a risk and said, I believe we can make a full length featured 2D animated film that can touch the hearts of children of all ages and then did that? Fine, then. But you have to admit that Disney as a company is truly dying. Now, before we end this, let me first say a story of my own. Once upon a time in 2010, my family went to go see Disney's Tangled. It was the second Disney film I saw in theaters. Despite Disney being a large part of my childhood, I never really saw any of the films in theaters and technically I don't remember the first one that I saw. Apparently it was Tarzan. Like I said, it was too long ago and I don't remember. So the first one I count is Tangled and I absolutely adore that film and I still do love it. Little did I know, however, Disney's Tangled would be Disney's tombstone. Everything I loved about Disney, everything that made Disney Disney, died during or after that film. No more 2D animation, only short, catchy titles, no more classic Disney villains. Some might say Mr. Krabs, whose name I can't remember from Moana, would count as a classic Disney villain. I say no because he's not the main villain, so I don't count him. All of the girls are stuck at the adorable stage. No more traditional storytelling. Not even one smidge of romance after Tangled. Like at all. My brother pointed this fact out to me this year, and I always knew it in the back of my brain, but it never really clicked on how bad it was in that Disney has not done a romance film in over 10 years. And look, I'm not saying all films need to be romance films, and you shouldn't have to shoehorn in a romance in a film that doesn't require just to match some quota. But seriously, none in over 10 years? Do not say Frozen, that doesn't count. One, because the relationship between Anna and Kristoff is dog crap in my opinion. They criticize how Hans and Anna's relationship of falling in love with a man you just met and wanting to marry him is bad, but then apparently one fixer upper later, one of the worst Disney songs in my opinion, and now we're supposed to believe, think that they're in love? Sure, they didn't get married right after, but the film still wants you to think that they're in love. And two, even if you did like the relationship between Anna and Kristoff and think that they made a cute couple, it's still not the main focus of the film. The relationship between the sisters, Elsa and Anna is, which isn't bad for a change, but like I said, no romance in over 10 years, even non-Disney princess films had a little bit of romance in them. Tarzan, Hercules, Robin Hood, Black Cauldron, and somewhat even Atlantis. It wasn't in every film, and it doesn't need to be in every film, but it was a lot, and like I said, it shouldn't be shoehorned in just to meet some quota. I don't need or expect Moana or Encanto to be romance stories. I'm not saying you should change them, but seriously, none? It's almost like they don't like it. I just mean that it's no longer 1937, and we absolutely wrote a Snow White she's that is... She's not going to be yeah, saved by the prince. She's not going to be saved by the prince, and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. I mean, you know, the, the original cartoon came out in 1937, and very evidently so. <laughs> um, there is a big focus on her love story. Um, with a guy who literally stalks her. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Weird. Sure, Rachel Zegler. Criticize the film you're remaking that also started the company that is giving you the job. You go right ahead. See how that works out for you. Does it not occur to these people that maybe making fun of the original film of the one that you're remaking isn't a smart idea? and that maybe the people who'd want to see your remake like the original, so you probably should just shut up and not talk bad about it? Or do these people just have lint for brains? The magic of true love is dead. All in the accounts that the hacks who are currently running Disney are just incapable of understanding it. I feel that Disney also wanted to step away from their true love message because they wanted to shut the feminists up you know, the ones who always complain, she's marrying a man she just met, which final side rant, that just isn't true, at least not all of the time. Rapunzel and Eugene definitely got married, but it's implied that it was quite a while before it actually happened. Well, I'm pleased to tell you that after years and years of asking and asking and asking, I finally said yes. Eugene. And even if you took the TV show out of canon, it still mentioned that Eugene spent a long time asking her. 
Aladdin and Jasmine didn't even get married at the end of their movie, and if you counted the sequels and TV show, which I have seen all the episodes of the TV show and both the sequels, uh, which aren't so bad, then you really know it's a long time before they got married. Aladdin's probably, like, ancient, like in his 30s. Belle and Adam were obviously in love, but it doesn't show that they got married right at the end. As for Ariel, yes, it does skip to her wedding day, but considering how no one really knew about mermaids outside of some sailors, to now mermaids and the Mermaid King being guests at the prince's royal wedding because the prince is marrying the Mermaid King's daughter, that could make one believe that quite a bit of time has actually passed when you really do think about it. They just skipped over it. As for Shang, he just stayed over for dinner at Mulan's house. He didn't marry her. Uh, Pocahontas, uh, well, that was based off a real story and they didn't really get anything right anyway, so let's just skip that one. Now, obviously, there are some that did get married fairly quickly. Tiana and Naveen did get married quickly, but I feel like this was just because it was trying to capture the classic Disney era feeling. Which, yeah, let's talk about those. I said earlier that Disney's classical films were more on an emotional, heart-moving level than an in-depth, logical, mind-thinking storytelling level. I remember watching the 1941 film Sullivan's Travels, and yeah, for those who do not know, it's about a director who makes successful comedies, but they're kind of shallow, and he's tired of doing that, so he wants to make a life-changing dramatic film that creates a cultural impact. To get the authentic feeling, he dresses as a hobo and takes to the streets. Anyway, one long journey later, he realizes that current life sucks right now, and people don't want a drama. They don't need something to remind them of how crappy their life really is. And when he sees a showing of Walt Disney's 1934 Playful Pluto, he realizes that sometimes the most precious thing is making people laugh and feel good. Now, obviously not all of the films during the time of the Great Depression and both World Wars were all comedies. I'm aware of this, I have watched a lot of the films from this time period, and I love a lot of them, and not all of them were haha -ha comedies, a lot of them were dramas. However, I do believe that Walt Disney and the people who were working at his studio felt a similar feeling to the film Sullivan's Travels, and that what was important was to make fun cartoons that could be enjoyed by all. And the people at Walt Disney Studios took a huge risk, and they made Snow White. Now that's not to say that the Disney Snow White film is devoid of logic or continuity, and it still kept the idea of treating the audience with a level of intelligence present throughout the entire film. However, it also knew what people wanted to see most in this film was something that was heartfelt and good and pure and the reason why he did this in 2d animation is because he believed this would be the best method for doing that and it was so successful that they repeated it with the ever films the Disney company wanted to unlock the inner child in everyone and so they put a more simpler and pure messaging within their films this is why true love is so present in a lot of their films and this is also why they don't go into long depth of explaining how this love works because that wasn't the point of the films. It was just to give you the emotion and the feelings that come with those experiences, not to explain them. Look, I'm not saying that Disney Studios is a perfect company devoid of flaws. I'm not saying that Walt Disney was a perfect man devoid of flaws. There are a million videos on YouTube blaming all the horrible things that Disney Studios, Walt Disney, and all of its associates have done just like everyone else in Hollywood. I'm also not trying to give Disney Studios and Walt Disney all of the singular credit for all of animation because there were a lot of people who did contribute to the making of animation. Disney was not the only one. However, I'm not going to deny all the beauty that Disney created. It pushed forward animation, created new technology to tell stories, and gave so many people wonderful childhood memories, me included. And with all of that success, the company has finally reached its 100th anniversary just to become what it is now. 
Overpriced parks that can't clean up their messes and are a bit underwhelming. Two franchises bought that once printed money and now one can even release more than one successful film in a year and it never has yet to release a film since 2019. And the ever film that they released by that studio flopped big time. And then finally you have this bad film being the 100th anniversary special. Honestly, if you really do want the feel of 100 years of Disney, then just go watch Once Upon a Studio. That was a million times better. Now, as we come to the ending of this very long video, the 100th anniversary question must be asked, is Disney's Wish the worst Disney film? And I can safely say, without a doubt, the answer is no, it's not. Despite all the flaws that the film has, despite how much I personally hated it, I still wouldn't say it is the it's not worst out of all of Disney's main 62 animated films. Out of all of the main 62 animated films, the title of worst Disney film would still probably go to Home on the Range or Chicken Little. Underneath all the bad that Disney's Wish does indeed have, I can also see some semblance of a good story that did indeed want to be told. It's just sad that that story got murdered in the studio before it was ever released to theaters and what we are now seeing is the half rotten corpse of that story being tossed in front of us while wearing the skin of a new story on top of it and that new story just isn't really fought out or given much time for whatever reason. And to me that semblance of the rotten story beneath that crappy new story does make me say that it's not the worst that I've seen, and I'm sure many of Evers would agree with me on that. However, I will state, when talking about the ever two mentioned films that I gave the title of worst Disney films, Chicken Little and Home in the Range, I do think something needs to be stated. Okay, uh, honestly, uh, for Chicken Little, um, I'm gonna be clear, I think I s see something in that film, something that no one else sees, including the creators, but yes, in the end, Chicken Little is a worse film, despite the fact that I did kind of enjoy it when I first watched it a long time ago when I was a kid. But in the case of Home on the Range, I'm not sure if I would actually put it totally worse than Disney's Wish. Now don't get me wrong, it's more annoying and stupid. However, I do really feel like the film Home on the Range is actually achieving what is supposed to be achieved. It's a film about stolen cows by a singing cattle thief. Its animation is nice, story is simple, and it is consistent, and the villain song is better than the villain song we got in this film. In the end, it's a dumb story for kids, and that's what it is, a dumb story for kids. It's not that deep, like at all nor is it trying to be. This is. Wish is trying to be one of Disney's greats, and it's not just trying to be a great, it's trying to be the great for its 100th anniversary. Chicken Little, Home on the Range, The Rescuers, Dinosaur, Oliver and Company, all of Disney's weaker films, a part of its 62 lineups, were not trying to be anything special, because in the end, when you get down to it, they're not. They weren't made in any real poignant time for Disney, they weren't the 50th film in the official animated film lineup, nor were they an anniversary film celebrating any big anniversary. Which, fun fact, do you actually know what movie actually came out during Disney's last grand anniversary, that being its 50th anniversary? Can you guess? Place your bets on what you think that film was off the top of your head, no cheating by looking it up. The answer to that question is Robin Hood. Which, yeah, if I'm going to be honest, before I did the research for this review, I actually had no idea that Robin Hood was the film to come out in the exact year that Disney hit its 50th anniversary. Mainly because from what I could see, there was no promotion for this film praising it being a shining example of the company's achievements over its 50 years of existence. The film wasn't filled with a million references to try to get people to say, look, we're 50 years old, which one reason for this is probably because during this time, the company was pretty down. 
just kind of like it is now, only this time I don't feel like Disney is going to be making a comeback was an ever renaissance era. One reason for this is because even though the films made during the years 1961 and 1988 were indeed more lackluster and not as critically or financially as successful to what Disney had previously made in its earlier days, those films at least had passion. The people who made them had a passion for storytelling and not story preaching. They also did not have a strong disdain towards Disney's past. If you can't move on from these issues, then you can't recover. And personally, I don't think they can move on from these issues. Because guess what? In the end, if you hate your past, I can't really see how you ever hope to relive the glory days of your past and reach the same level of success as it. Because in the end, what made you successful in the past has now fundamentally changed. And if the people in the present day liked you for what was in your past, which you are now trying to change because the past was so fundamentally evil, then guess what? You can't expect people to still like you for the same reason because the reasons are no longer there. But no matter what side you are on in your personal beliefs, you cannot deny Disney has undoubtedly changed, whether it be in its messaging, its animation style, or its general direction, which change isn't necessarily a bad thing. However, if you are going to change, then actually change. Don't be in some awkward middle where you still want the legacy of your past, and so you constantly bait people with nostalgia of that past, while also head towards some new direction that you claim is better because everything in the past was horrible and evil. You need to stop reading those old Disney films. Filling your head with thoughts! Why don't you take the advice of your newer characters and actually do what Kylo Ren said and actually Not the past time. Then do what Elsa sung about and Let it go! If you're going to change, then actually change and move on. If the things in your past were so bad, then stop remaking them. If the things in your past were so bad, then stop making sequels to them. If the things in your past were so bad, then don't even do the same genre anymore because you already say that the elements within that genre are elements you don't want to do because they were so bad. Stop making subversive jokes, jabs, or shallow references towards a past that you want to destroy just to catch the eye of those who loved your past creations. It doesn't work. And hey, it's not even always the things that were made in the old ancient days of Disney's beginning in the 1930s that are being disrespected, but even the things that were made literally five minutes ago, like how Zootopia made a job at the song Let It Go from Frozen, and how you just can't sing a song and move past difficult things. I'm sorry, I thought you wanted me to believe that Frozen and Elsa's rush development that was limited to just let it go was actually good story writing. So why on earth are you making fun of it here just to point out how bad it actually was? I said in my Wonka review, I believe that Hollywood and especially Disney has lost the ability to have sincerity and doing stuff like this is a prime example of it. Some might think this is a nit in the pick, but I personally believe this is a small example to the larger problem of the spirit of animosity and disingenuous nature that has infested all of Disney, and we just can't have anything serious, can't enjoy the past, have to laugh at everything. But hey, if you want a pure example that represents everything that is wrong with modern Disney Studios, then well, look no further than the Abomination live-action remakes that they keep doing for some reason. For the love of sheep, stop doing this. I agree with the YouTuber Despot of the Ant-Man, probably pronounced that name wrong, and his observation that he made in that these are not even remakes. They're just plagiarism on a grand scale. Generally speaking, the people who loved the original past films will not like these. Generally speaking, the people who hated the original past films will not like these. You still did Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, despite in how you say the originals were so bad in its messaging. And guess what? All of the fixes you made was it just added a whole new host of flaws into the film. People like me and my sister who love the original Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast didn't even 
bother to see these films and we'll never see these films because it doesn't give us fond nostalgia and reminds us of the original it just shows us that you're bitter against the original that we were so in love with and the people who hated the original little mermaid and beating the beast didn't end up going to see this or like it because no matter how much you change or fix it it won't change or fix the fact that you're still doing Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. These people don't like fairy tales or the elements that make a fairy tale a fairy tale, and that's fine. Nothing is wrong with that. What is wrong, however, is when Disney tries to appeal to both types of audience. One that does like fairy tales and one that does not like fairy tales. And to be honest, I think they keep trying to reach the latter audience so much is because the people who are currently in charge of these fairy tale films don't even like fairy tale films. In a way, it's no different than how Disney took comic book films, put people who never read or liked comic books in charge of these comic book films, comic book films that were once so successful they could even reach non-comic book fans and be enjoyed by them, but now the people you put in charge of these comic book films, Disney, now are making changes to these comic book films just in the hopes of reaching an audience that doesn't generally go to see comic book films. And now we have comic book films that are made by people who don't like comic books trying to appeal to an audience who doesn't like comic book films while saying the people who do like comic book films are evil and horrible and everything that they loved about comic book films is evil and horrible. And it's time for a change, so we gotta change things. What? In fact, from what I could see, the audience that does intend to enjoy these comic book films made by people who do not like comic books tend to also be the type of people, and I'm not saying that this is all of them, but I did notice this is quite a few of them. They tend to be the type of people who live out their days being modern day Captain Jack Sparrows, meaning your mythical modern audience does exist slightly, but they tend to be the people who do not pay one red cent to you, which is why Captain Marvel 2, I mean Miss Marvel, was one of the worst films of 2023, financially speaking. If Disney truly wanted to move away from their past that is oh so bad and horrible, then great, fine, but you have to do something new and do it great. But if you want the same type of success slash audience you had in the past, then do what pleased your audience in the past. It doesn't have to be the exact same thing. We don't want things to get stale and stagnant. But don't lose the same spirit and don't trash the past. Tell good stories that can stand on their own two feet without meta knowledge or meta humor or don't have message before the heart. One person pointed this out on Twitter and I will try to see if I can pull up it to show you what I mean. That the film Meet the Robinsons, you know, the film that Disney forgot to put in their end credits of this film when doing the memorial segment of going over their past 62 animated films was a better memorial film for Disney than Wish was, and I have to agree with that sentiment. There was no hatred towards the past in Meet the Robinsons, and it was a celebration of all the good that was done and the bright future that could be obtained. It also ended with a quote from Walt Disney himself. It also seemed to hold more of the spirit that the earlier Disney films had. Also, despite the 3D animation, being not amazing, it's also not bad for the time. I mean, it was Disney's first time really doing that since Chicken Little and that was a disaster. It also had a few newer things in it for the time. On a similar note, I said myself that the Studio Ghibli film The Boy and the Heron was Disney's wish done right. It had beautiful 2D animation, which Yes, there was 3D elements throughout the film here and there, but the primary medium was 2D animation. It had the spirit of the original studio throughout the entire thing, and it celebrated the studio's legacy and Miyazaki's past works. It had references to Miyazaki's past works littered throughout it, however the film was not dependent on them and if you could not pick them up, nothing was lost. I also do find it extremely laughable how both The Boy and the Heron and the before mentioned Puss in Boots and The Last Wish came out the exact same year as Wish, and yet both of those films did many things that Wish was also attempting to do with its story only a million times better. 
Those being, in the case of the boy and the heron, it celebrated a studio's legacy and also made references to past works. It gave us amazing animation and a really good in-depth story that was really deep. As for The Last Wish, it had good villains, a deep story, and had a good message, and both films had no bitterness towards their past. Puss in Boots was also two minutes shorter than Wish, and still handles its stuff amazing. Now, as for Studio Ghibli films, they always typically tend to be longer. This is because, undoubtedly, animation is viewed as a more serious and profitable form of storytelling in Japan than compared to how it is viewed in America, where Hollywood really does still see animation as being something that is still just primarily meant for kids. In fact, the longest running American animated film from what I can remember is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and that is still shorter than some anime and non-anime foreign films that I know of. The longest running anime film that I've ever personally seen was Neon Genesis Evangelion Price Upon a Time, which clocked in at being 15 minutes longer than Across the Spider-Verse. Also, Neon Genesis Evangelion is a successful media franchise, but it is nowhere near as successful or popular as Spider-Man. Price Upon Time is also the fourth film in the Ava movie lineup, whereas Across the Spider-Verse is the second, and yet both equally have stunning and beautiful animation and a lot of visible effort put into these films. Story-wise, I will let one's own personal preference be the judge as to which is better, as I think both have a lot of good qualities to them, but also a lot of flaws. And let's face it, Spider-Man's always been more normie friendly when you compare it to Neon Genesis Evangelion, which isn't even liked by a lot of anime fans. However, personally, I will state that even though I felt Price Upon Time was more confusing, I did actually enjoy it in the end more than Across the Spider-Verse. And animation-wise, I think Price Upon a Time is just as good, if not better, than Across the Spider-Verse. Probably gonna get some hate for that. Look, at the very least, it's no worse in animation-wise. It's less stylized, but it's not worse, and that's even on top of it being longer and the fourth film in its lineup. Now, in the end, I bring all of this up just to really make the point that animation in Japan is taken very serious when you compare it to how it is in America. And so, because of this, Anime usually has benefits going for it that American animation does not, such as mature themes and a longer running time. A longer running time is an objective fact, but mature themes, I mean, there is some American movies that do have mature themes and also are animated, but that is more of a rarity, let's face it. And so, I do believe this point should be brought up in Disney's slight defense, since some might think it a bit unfair since I did just compare a rated PG-13 anime film that's over two hours to a PG Disney film that's barely an hour and a half. However, I will state that there are still a lot of anime films that are the same length or shorter than modern Disney films and that are also for a younger audience and those films still have better animation, character, and or plot. Final side note that I just wanted to add, it just clicked in my head that the Studio Ghibli film, Kiki's Delivery Service, came out in the exact same year as Disney's The Little Mermaid. And despite them being made by two different companies, they actually had both equally good animation. They're different, but Disney's Little Mermaid is pretty much just as good as Kiki's Delivery Service. So meaning at one time, Disney was making animation that was on par with anime, and not just any anime, Studio Ghibli anime. But yet, somehow, Disney lost the ball and this drastically changed. You even had a head start compared to Studio Ghibli when it came to animation. How did you let this happen? Also, out of all the Studio Ghibli films that I've seen, even its weakest one, Tales of Ursae, is a million times better than this film, and I would rather watch Tales of Ursae over pretty much everything that Disney has been coming out with lately, with the only real exception being Encanto. 
Also, if you're thinking I'm being overly kind to anime, I do have to state this one fact that if you were to count all of my favorite animated films in general, including anime, it would be Little Mermaid, Anastasia, Dumbo, Land Before Time, Sleeping Beauty, and Winnie the Pooh. And again, that's counting anime. Meaning, out of my top animated list, anime isn't even on the top. Meaning, you also don't need long length of time, big budget, or incredible CGI to accomplish the feat of making a great animated film, as I think each one of those ones that I mentioned did it quite perfectly. So back to my original point that I was trying to make back when I attempted to end this video much earlier before finding several more rabbit holes for myself to go down, which resulted in 90 more rants and 10 more audio files to drive myself insane with, the fact is this. None of Disney's previous weaker or downright bad films that were indeed worse than this film were parading itself as Disney's 100th anniversary film. And so, in that aspect, it doesn't make them worse than this film. This, however, was Disney's 100th anniversary film, and it did an awful job at being that. And like I said, the things that Wish was trying to accomplish is not impossible. The things that I wanted from Wish is not impossible. Studio Ghibli has done it, ever countless of anime studios have done it, ever western studios have done it, DreamWorks has done it in the past and occasionally still managed to do it to present day, and of course, the biggest example is Disney itself at one time has done what I wanted Wish to do. The fact that Disney can't do it today is a result of the studio's change in priorities, ideology, their rejection of their past, endless greed, poor work environment, lack of talent, and the lust for power. They've become the classic Disney villains that they had in their old films, and now their ego is so big that it makes them feel like they are untouchable, and that they could resort to quantity over quality and just release whatever slush they felt like, and they believe that the people would just accept it because it has Disney's brand on it. And some people do accept it, and that's fine if you truly do like it. Just don't convince yourself that you do like it because it's Disney. But for me, it's not. I demand more. Something that isn't even out of the realm of possibilities. Something that Disney once did do, but no longer can do. And like I said, the fact that they released this as the final candle on their 100th anniversary year cake makes the failure even worse. And also the fact that it made Disney lose $200 million also makes its failure even worse. So there's that too. So. And not a star I would ever make a wish on. Last recorded note. Why on God's green earth is the tagline for this film, be careful what you wish for? No one is careful for what they wish for. Like, at all, throughout the entire film. If anything, this film has the exact opposite message in the fact that everyone just makes their wishes willy-nilly without a second thought, and they want them granted. Uh, if anything, the closest thing you could get to that is be careful who you give your wish to, because they gave it to Max Stupido. But even than that, it really has no correlation outside of, again, wishes. My brain. My brain. Ooh. Woo! We're done. That was my long, long video critique of Disney's wish and Disney itself. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, do all the YouTube things. If you didn't, hey, you're still here. Thanks for watching this far anyway. I don't do things like this really at all, let alone something this big, and it was a lot of work trying to get this to match up with everything and figure everything out. These videos are a lot of work. My complete admiration goes to anybody who does this on a regular basis. For now, I'm going to go back to looking on Revolution in full color. Hope you enjoyed. Until then, bye!